Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Today we're going to get into REST memory management pattern and talk about ownership and borrowing. Ownership is one of the features that sets Rust apart from other programming languages. Languages like Java, C Sharp, Dart, and Go use a garbage collector, which is a part of the runtime or virtual machine that runs along with your program, dynamically cleaning up and freeing memory where it can. Garbage collectors are efficient, but they are a bit too costly for a systems level language like Rust. Other system level languages like C and C++ allow the developer to explicitly define when and where memory can be allocated and deallocated. While this method yields control and performance over a garbage collector, it also introduces complexity and the potential for many different errors. Rust, on the other hand, opted to set a few intuitive rules for how the compiler will treat data types in memory via its ownership and borrowing models. Now before we get into these rules, let's discuss the stack and the heap. We'll use this simple example as a guideline. Now as the compiler reads through our code here, it populates a bunch of frames called stack frames. And I'm going to represent the stack frames using these block comments. Each of our frames will be named after the functions that they represent. And it will contain pointers, values, and variables which are used by that function. If we look at the main function frame here, it's called main and it has the variable x with the value one, as well as the call to the print function down here. When the compiler hits a new function call, a new frame is created and populated with the contents of the call. So when we hit this print function, we can create a new frame like this, representing the print function. Now it's important to note that our newly created frame cannot access any of the data from our main frame unless it's explicitly passed through as an argument. So I can't access this x equals one value unless it gets passed into our print function, which it is. But if we had another variable in here, then I couldn't access it from our print frame. When we hit the end of the frame, that would be the final line in the comment block then we go back to where the execution started in the last frame. Once we hit the end of the print frame, this frame gets removed from the stack and we come back to after where print was called in the main frame. And in this case, because nothing happens after print, this frame then gets removed and we go back up to the global frame where the global frame gets removed and the application exits because it's finished. Now it's important to note that each of these frames represents the scope of the function that it represents, with the global stack frame being the global scope of the application and so on. The stack memory model is pretty efficient, though it must follow a set of rules. Firstly, all data is put on the top of the stack and it's popped off the top of the stack. In other words, when we get data or when we put data onto the stack, we're always doing it from the same place. Secondly, data on the stack must be a fixed size at compile time. If the compiler cannot determine how much memory a type needs, then it cannot be put directly on the stack. So if we look at our example here, we have our x value, which is a type of u8. We know at compile time that the u8 is a size of eight bytes in memory. Because we know it's a size of eight bytes in memory, we can put this directly on the stack, and that's why it shows up in our stack frame. In Rust, all of the primitive types live on the stack. Types like the Boolean, numbers, slices, characters, fixed size arrays, tuples containing primitives, and function pointers can all sit on the stack. What happens when we need to use a more complex data structure which may grow or shrink in the future? Types like strings and vectors put a pointer on the stack which points towards the memory address inside of something called the heap. You can think of the heap like a big hash map of data where each piece of data corresponds with a memory address. If we look at our example here, we now have a string and we're mutating that string by using spop to take the last character from the string and just throw it out. And then we're printing the string out. Now again, the compiler will build a stack frame, but when it runs into the string in our stack frame, 
it goes and it takes the string and it allocates it to the heap like this. So we know that our string has a length of eight, so we need to allocate eight cells in our heap map to this string. And then we can take the first value of this cell, the first address, and put it back on the stack so that we can identify where on the heap our data structure actually is. We take that address along with the length and the capacity and that defines the pointer which actually sits on our stack. So instead of just putting the entire string on the stack, we can just have this metadata which points towards the data on the heap. This pointer which we've now created has a fixed size and can reside on the stack, but it points towards a piece of data which does not have to have a fixed size, which resides on the heap. If we change the string, some of the values in our pointer will also change. So for instance, we're calling s.pop. This removes the g from our string. The length of our string will change from eight to seven, but the capacity will stay the same because when we first initialized the string, we had a length of eight. And the capacity represents how many cells in the heap we've reserved for this data structure. So even though we've popped off the G, that last cell is still reserved for this data structure just in case we decide to grow it some more. Now, if on the other hand, we go to increase the size of our string, then both the length and capacity will increase to account for this new change. And the new data will set next to the old data on the heap. So essentially we'd start to allocate cells next to the existing cells on our heap hash map. Sometimes, however, it might be necessary for the address pointer to change in response to this increase in size. For instance, maybe there aren't enough slots next to each other for us to fit our new string in the same position, and so we need to find a new position on the heap. All right, so now that we know a bit about the stack and the heap, let's move on to the rules of ownership. Ownership in Rust follows three rules. Firstly, each value has a variable which is its owner. In our example, the variable s owns the pointer to our string. And if we create another variable here called x, then we can say that x owns the value 1. Now the next rule in ownership is probably the most important one, and that is that there can only be one owner of a value at a given time. Let's look at this example using primitives. So we've taken 10 and we've assigned it to x. In other words, x owns 10. Then we're taking x and we're assigning it to y, and we're also assigning it to z. Now we know that there can only be one owner at a given time, but as you'll note, we're not getting any kind of error here. So what's actually happening here is that the compiler is creating copies every single time we're assigning x to a new variable. So the stack frame for this main function would look like this, where we have x equaling 10, y equaling 10, and z equaling 10. It does not, however, look like this. X is the sole owner of this value of 10, and Y can't own this value of 10 too, and Z can't own this value of 10. It's extremely cheap and fast for the compiler to do this because the data type has a fixed size, which means that the data type is only on the stack. If we come back up to our stack types, we can now amend this list to be copy types as well because all of these types, which reside on the stack, are able to be cheaply copied by the compiler. And they also implement a trait called copy. We can create a function like this to see if our type implements the copy trait. So we're passing in a generic type called t, and we're using a guard to say that t implements the copy trait. If we come up here and we put in, say, a boolean, you can see that there's no error. If we then put in a character, again, there is no error. If we put in a slice of string, again, there's no error. And if we put in our number 10, again, there's no error. However, if we do put in a string, you can see that we do in fact get an error where it says that the trait copy is not implemented for the string type. 
Now don't worry too much about the syntax of this function. I'm just using it to make a point. So then what happens if we try to copy a non-fixed size data type like a string? As we saw, our string type doesn't implement the copy trait. Our dynamically sized type leaves a pointer on the stack which points to the data on the heap. If we copy this pointer over to a new variable, say b, both a and b are now owners of the data on the heap which breaks the one owner rule. And because both of these pointers contain information about length and capacity of the data on the heap, if the data on the heap is changed through one of these variables, then the other variable has no means of knowing about it. So if, for instance, I called b.pop, a would not change its length to correspond with it because it wouldn't know about that operation. And so then the pointer that we have for a would be fundamentally wrong. Then when the compiler goes to deallocate these values, it would then try to clean up the same data twice. This also could lead to a pointer which points towards a piece of data that doesn't exist anymore, which is called a dangling pointer. So instead of copying the data from one variable to the next, we move the pointer's ownership to the latest variable. This means that the original variable no longer has any ownership over the pointer or the data in the heap. So our stack frame would look like this, where we have A pointing towards the pointer, and then as soon as we assign B, all of this data associated with A goes away, and A becomes invalid. And after we've declared B, we can now say that B is the sole owner of the data on the heap. If I try to do something with A after we've moved it to B, you can see that we get an error because A has moved to B and A no longer exists in this scope. Moving variables is very performant for the compiler because it only needs to copy the pointer from one variable to the other and then delete the original copy. Now there are cases where we may want to have two variables with the same data inside of them. And for these cases, we have the clone trait. The clone trait copies the data structure in the heap to another address in the heap and then gives the new pointer to the associated variable. So if we come down to our stack frame here, we can see that A points towards the address 0, then B points towards a completely different address in the heap, even though it has the same length, capacity, and it even points towards a string that says a string. This, of course, obeys the rules of ownership because there are now two distinct and separate pointers and two data structures in the heap. If one changes, then the other one is not affected at all. Now, the final rule of ownership has to do with scope. When the owner of a value goes out of scope, then the value will be dropped out of memory. I've mentioned before that our stack frames here are essentially the scope of our functions. In Rust, when you define a variable, the variable is scoped to the set of brackets that surrounds it. This is called block scoping. So both A and B exist from where they're defined till we hit the ending bracket here, in which case they get dropped or deallocated from memory. Now with regards to ownership, function arguments work similarly to variable assignments. So if we look at this example here where we have a function called own string, we define that we want to have a variable a, which is of string type, and then the function does nothing with it. But what essentially happens here is when we pass a and b into this own string function, the variables a and b get moved to the scope of the own string function and to this new a variable. So this function takes ownership of these values and when the function terminates, the value is dropped. We're also allowed to return ownership from a function by just returning the value from the function. So here you can see that we take in the value a, and then we just return that value a. And in here, what we can do is pass a into own string, and then pass it back into another variable called a, and then pass b into own string, and pass it back to another variable called b. 
And so ownership moved from our main scope to this function scope and then back to our main scope. Tracking ownership may seem easy enough, but it can get complicated when you start to deal with larger examples. So we need a way to pass around values without having to pass around ownership. And this is where the concept of borrowing comes into play. Borrowing as a concept has its own set of rules. So when we borrow, we're allowed to have infinite borrows for read-only access. If we look at this example here, you can see that we create A, which is of course our string, and then we're taking A and we're assigning it to B, C, and D, and we're using this ampersand before the value of A. And what this is doing is it's actually taking A and borrowing it to B, C, and D, rather than just assigning it to B, C, and D. And because we're just using an ampersand and not an ampersand with a mute keyword, we're giving these variables read-only access to our string. So even though our string here is mutable, these values are not because they are read-only borrows of this string. Now each of these ampersands creates what's called a reference. So we're creating references to A by borrowing A to B, C, and D. Another important rule in borrowing is the fact that when we're making read-only borrows, the original data becomes immutable for their duration. So even though our string here is defined as a mutable string, it can't be mutated while we're borrowing from it with these variables. And like with ownership, a borrow will last until the end of the current scope. So these borrows start when we define the values and then they end at the end of this bracket here. Once the borrow ends though, we can go back to the original owner and mutate the value freely. As you can see here, I've created a new block scope and I've bound all of our borrows to the block scope. So these borrows will end at this curly bracket. And once this scope finishes, we can then go back and start to mutate our original value using the A variable. Now the final rule of borrowing has to do with what are called mutable borrows. So we're only allowed to pass one borrow at a time for write access or mutability. So while we're allowed to create infinite read-only borrows, we're only allowed to create one mutable borrow. We define a mutable borrow by using the ampersand followed by the keyword mute, followed by the value that we want to borrow. So in this case, we're borrowing A mutably with the value of X. And I can take this value of X and bind it to its own scope. And this way, when I go to print out a will have called pop on the A string twice, so it will lose two characters. Now the reason why Rust restricts mutable borrows to only a single borrow at a time is to avoid a concept known as a data race. A data race happens when you have two or more pointers trying to access the same memory location at the same time, while at least one of these pointers is writing to the data. When this happens, the operations are not synchronized across all of the pointers, and then we get all kinds of icky issues. Function arguments, just like with ownership, also work like variables in the case of borrowing. So here I've defined a function called own and borrow stuff, and in it we're passing in three different values. One of them is a mutable borrow of a string, the other one is a borrow of a boolean, and then the last one is a ownership of a U8 number. So when we invoke this function, we want to pass in a mutable borrow for our string, then the reference for our boolean, and then finally the value for our U8, and the function will now take ownership and borrow the values accordingly, it's also important to note that you can borrow parts of complicated data structures like strings, structs, and vectors. So here you can see that I'm taking the index of one to three of our string and I'm putting it into a mutable 
value a as a borrow, then I'm taking the index from 2 to 5 of the string and putting it into b as a borrow. And then again, I'm borrowing from these values into other values. These slices will work like any other borrow, and they follow all of the same rules of our borrowing system. But keep in mind that, for instance, when we slice from a string, we turn the string into a primitive type. So now we have the copy trait and we can more freely move our data around in an easier way than when we just deal with a string or a vector. Another thing I want to show you guys really quickly before we leave is the definition of a string in Rust. As you can see here, the string is just a struct and it's a struct with one field and that field is a vector of U8 type. If we dig into the vector type, you can see that it's a bit more complicated than a string because it has two fields, but the two fields are literally just the length and the raw vector type. Digging further into the raw vector, you can see that it's almost set up like the pointer that we were talking about before. So we have the pointer itself, then we have the capacity, and then we have this A value. So even though our representation of pointers was a little bit simplified compared to how they actually look inside a memory. It's more or less the model that they use when we're dealing with those types of things. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you want to catch more videos like this, go ahead and click that notification bell. And if you want to support the channel, then feel free to go check out the Patreon channel, pitch in a few dollars. Have a good night.